So actually the topic um, is Dan Sabbath approached me and suggested I would speak about minimal residual disease in acute myeloid leukemia. And I thought this is actually a great topic because it sort of is one that the hematopathologists very directly inf have influenced and continue to influence how we as clinicians think about our patients. And it's a topic that I know some of the faculty here in the laboratory medicine department are active in, in research. And I think as a clinician, I can say that we're very proud that we have a high expertise in, in, um, in MRD here. And we certainly have taken advantage of that expertise and used it scientifically. And I'm going to show you some of those studies. Um, so I have no real conflict of interest that is relevant for this presentation. And I thought I would just very briefly talk about the value of a, of a therapeutic response and a complete remission in acute myeloid leukemia and then introduce this concept and, and measurement of minimal residual disease, and then spend some time talking about MRD as a biomarker of therapeutic outcome um, in AML, and then MRD as a biomarker for the therapeutic decision-making in this disease. And if time permitting, I'll, I'll want to finish off with sort of provocative data that sort of question some of the more, more um, conventional things we do in these days for, for diagnosis. Um, so effective chemotherapy drugs have become available for acute mild leukemia somewhere in the late 1940s. And it didn't take very long until it was recognized that achieving some response is actually a good thing. And this is maybe one of the early landmark studies published in the, in, in the 1960s where um, a group of about 60 patients with leukemia were um, investigated and it was simply looked, um, it was simply assessed what the relationship is between therapeutic response and survival. And as you can see, and certainly not surprising, people that had some kind of an improvement um, in blood counts or, or marrow involvement with leukemia, they survived longer than patients that didn't have any change in, in blood counts or, or leukemia burden. But what's perhaps a little less well known is that if you look at, well, why is this survival better? Then it turned out that the survival difference is really entirely due to the time that the patient had a response. So for example, if a patient had treatment for 12 months and you thought that the patient was responding between months three and 11, if you subtracted those, those months, then the survival becomes really superimposable to patients that never had a response. And even at that time, it was recognized that if the leukemia goes away completely, then that means something better for patients than if the leukemia can still be detected. So studies like, the, like this have, cert, have led to the fact that a complete remission was for many, many years considered the gold standard for therapeutic success in AML. And as you probably all know, this is largely based on, or at least initially entirely based on morphologic criteria, um, essentially saying that you can't detect any leukemia anymore with, with, with um, no involvement in the bone marrow um, or anywhere else in the body, and with evidence of return of normal blood counts as, as a reflection of recovery of bone marrow function. And this, this complete remission still continues to have value. And we looked at this not too long ago in a large cohort of about 2,000 patients that had newly diagnosed AML and were treated at MD Anderson Cancer Center in more recent decades. And again, just like the old study, we looked at the relationship between response and survival. And as you can see on the slide, very similar to, to the old studies, if a patient achieved a CR with initial chemotherapy, that's the blue line, the survival was much better than if the patients did not achieve a, a, a response and were considered resistant to therapy. And even small deviations from that success, as perhaps reflected by this diagnostic entity of CR with incomplete platelet count recovery or CRP, um, 
has an impact on, on survival. And if you then look on, at the patients more closely that survive for, say, three or five years, and you look at those, you'll see that about 90% of those achieve the CR with initial chemotherapy. Out of those 10% that didn't, at least half of them, when you go back in the charts, you find that they achieved the remission sometime at a later stage. And in only a few percent of patients, we were unable to find a documented response, but likely it's still an underestimate given that patients were treated outside of the centers where we document responses very, very closely. But it's certainly fair to say that with intensive therapy, only very few patients will survive if they have not achieved the CR. So there's still value in, in, in this response entity. And that's by no means limited to intensive therapies. And this is just an example where um, um, one example with a lower intensity treatment. This is uh, a study from the United Kingdom cooperative group um, that has investigated the value of a low dose terpene treatment in a randomized fashion. And again, plotting response versus survival, you, you'll see that some patients um, had a response and some didn't. And again, those that responded, they lived longer. And even in the setting of low intensity therapy, the, in, the improvement in survival was very, very strongly related to achievement of a complete remission. So it seems pretty clear that it still has a value. But of course, the question is, and, and for this audience, it's mostly rhetorical, is a morphologic definition of CR, is that still, is that sufficient as a biomarker for an accurate prediction of outcome? And is it really good enough to help us clinically to make decisions with those patients? And of course, you're the department that will tell us the bad news about patients that, that just had a disease recurrence. But when you look in, again, in large studies, and this is, again, from the United Kingdom group, a very recent study on a large number of patients treated with intensive chemotherapy. And um, many, many patients will achieve a remission these days. But when you then look at what happens long time, you'll see on the left slide, and you can ignore that there's two different treatment arms. It doesn't really make a, a big of a difference. Um, that many patients will not remain in, in CR as time goes on. And, and this is, and this is shown on the right side, is primarily due to disease recurrence. But that's not only true for intensive chemotherapies, but of, that's also true for transplantation. These are sort of compiled data from the CIBMTR registry um, that spans a 10 year period of transplantation for adults with uh, sibling transplants. And even here, you can see that long term, only maybe 50 or 60% of patients that were transplanted in a complete remission will survive. And even though transplant has its own risks, and there are certainly deaths attributable to toxicities from the transplant, um, disease recurrence remains the single most important factor for, for um, shortened survival in these patients. So to sort of very briefly sort of summarize the one in one of AMR therapy, I think even in 2014, it's, it's very clear that a therapeutic response is associated with improved survival and that having or achieving a, a remission is certainly or seems required, but is not sufficient for long-term survival because relapse remains very common even in patients that have achieved what's, what's called a morphologic remission. And I think this, this observation alone is certainly evidence that, that for, for the clinicians, the morphology-based assessments of, of leukemia patients is clearly inadequate to detect tumor amounts that matter for patients.
And this is perhaps not too surprising when you think about how many cells we're talking about. And these are sort of very old estimates um, done from, from a group in Netherlands about 25 years ago. And what they came up with is that the total load of tumor cells at diagnosis is somewhere in the range of 10 to the 13 cells. And they estimated that the whole body contains about two times 10 to the 12th normal cells, hematopoietic cells in the marrow space. So if you do the math and you say, well, you know, 5% is considered the threshold for a morphologic remission. If you do the math, then you end up with as many as 10 to the 11th cells that can still be present at a time of morphologic remission. So the question obviously is, if you knew how many cells exactly are there, would that help you to be more precise in predicting who's going to relapse? And would that knowledge help you to make good decisions. And this concept of minimal residual disease, and I sort of put minimal in parentheses, just, or in, in, yeah, per, um, in quotation marks simply because of it's really not that minimal, um, is really based on this notion that there's a very close relationship between the amount of tumor cells and your likelihood and maybe your timing of disease recurrence. And Sarah Buckley, one of the residents here, um, wrote a review together with me two years ago. So and we sort of depicted this in one of the figures. Um, and that's the one that I've shown here. Is that just on, on you're looking at what's the proportion of leukemia cells and what happens over time. And obviously, if you have, and this marks the sort of the, the current limits of detection with different assay methodologies. And sort of the, the red part is where morphologically you can say this person has persistent disease. But then as you go lower, um, there's different methodologies that will allow you to detect, and I'll get, get back to those in a minute. And the idea with, with the MRD concept is that the further down your tumor burden goes, the, the less likely the disease will return and perhaps the longer it will take for disease to, to become clinically manifest again. And of course it can be that you can detect leukemia at some point and it will still come back. And that's certainly something that we very commonly, well, that we still see and I'll, I'll get back to this as well. So thinking about MRD and what would you need to have to measure it then there's a few criteria that will be essential. One is obviously you need it, whatever assay you're developing, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be specific, it needs to be sensitive. Um, it, and if the concept of this gradual relationship between tumor burden and, and disease recurrence is true, then it should allow quantification of the tumor burden as well. And then it should be reproducible and you should be able to easily standardize it across different laboratories. And depending on the disease you're looking at, there's a, there's a different set of assays that have been developed and proven or and thought to be helpful for disease detection. And for AML, there's primarily four methodologies that have been used. Um, and I'll, I'll just briefly touch on those. One is routine karyotyping in C2 or fluorescence in C2 hybridization, then PCR methods to either detect antigen receptor rearrangements or um, translocations, gene mutations, or aberrant expression levels of genes. Um, and then flow cytometry to detect immunophenotypic abnormalities of, of leukemia cells. And I will avoid a discussion which methodology is best, but just briefly go through some of the pros and cons. Um, and obviously, some of them are very standardized and widely used, such as routine karyotyping or FISH, and they're quantitative, but they have low sensitivity. If you routine karyotype, you're looking at 20 cells, that's not much better than looking at cells morphologically. 
fish, you're looking at typically in the range of a few hundred cells. So that adds somewhat in sensitivity, but it's not that much. And both methodologies are limited to subsets of patients that actually have abnormalities that are detectable with these tests. And then moving on to PCR, certainly several magnitudes more sensitive, still specific. You c it can be quantifiable, though that's technically somewhat of a challenge. Um, and it may be more rapid than karyotyping, for example. But it's also limited to subsets of patients. Um, and depending on what your target is, um, the abnormality may not be present on the disease recurrence. And that's certainly, we've, we've learned this with some of the mutations that probably as a reflection of them being acquired late in the leukemic um, process, they may not be on the clone that is present when the disease recurs. So it doesn't, it's not a particularly helpful test in all cases. Um, and then as the fourth methodology, flow cytometry has many of the advantages of PCR sensitive um, as well, and it, it's reasonably rapid, um, but it has disadvantages. It, it, it needs a lot of expertise to do, um, and it's very difficult to standardize. And there are cases that immunophenotypes are either not present or are lost as, as the disease evolves clinically. Um, but overall, maybe about 90% or so of, of AML patients do have immunophenotypic abnormalities, making flow cytometry a very useful methodology. And again, thinking about the concept of, of MRD, the prospects are really twofold. One is as a tool for outcome prediction. So can it be used to recognize early when a disease either persists or is on its way to return? Um, and the second prospect is a therapeutic one. Can you use this to make a good decision in sort of a risk stratified manner? And I'm going to talk about these two prospects individually in, in the next minutes. And it's very clear that most of the work that has been done so far has focused on this outcome prediction and very limited data is available on this, this question of can it actually be used for therapeutic decision making. Now, looking at MRD as a predictive factor, there's certainly several time points where this might be helpful. And just going through how you treat the patient in the clinic, um, they go through induction chemotherapy and then either continue with consolidation chemotherapy if the treatment was successful, or depending on the, the disease risk, you, you may decide to use a, use a transplantation approach, either an allogeneic or, or an autologous um, type of transplantation. So in, in each of these sort of steps along the treatment path, MRD may or may not be useful for, for outcome prediction. And this is sort of taken from a review written about two years ago um, that summarized some of the studies that were done on MRD as an outcome prediction marker using flow cytometry. And it sort of illustrates, um, I think, a number of things that are true for the field more broadly. One is that, A, there's been really numerous studies that now have looked at this. So it's not hard to find data on it. Um, the second one is that the methodologies, even though they're all flow cytometry based, they're very different from, from study to study. That, that applies to um, what are the thresholds that you consider um, for, to call a patient MRD positive. That is true for the time, the exact time point you're looking at. Um, and that applies to how exactly the methodology was that was used. But regardless of all these differences, the, the, the outcomes of all the studies are very, very similar. That is that MRD has proven very informative and, and, and able to identify a patient subset that has a much higher risk of disease recurrence. And that seems to be true 
when you take other factors into account and you look in multivariate analysis. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few examples um, from, from studies that have looked at the value of, of, of MRD during these early stages of AML therapy. This is a very recent study that um, the Children's Oncology Group has, has done on about, well, about 300 patients, but slightly over 200 had data available on the flow cytometry. And as, as you can see, um, the, regardless of the time point they looked at, the, the top panel looked at the end of the first induction therapy, end of second induction therapy in the middle, and then end of therapy at the end. Patients that, these are all patients that achieved morphologically remission, patients that were MRD negative by flow, flow cytometry had a much better survival and a much lower relapse rate than patients that were positive by flow cytometry for, for abnormal cells. And what this study has done, maybe differently to many others, is looking at the kinetics of MRD. And that's something that I think has been sort of ignored for in many of the studies. Um, so then rather just assuming it's a, it's a, it's a value at, at any given time point, so, so this, this study also looked at, well, how did you get there? Um, and again, this is looking at the end of treatment. And you compare patients that were, again, all in remission, um, but some had no minimal residual disease at all the time points to look at after treatment initiation. And those did by far the best. Those is sort of the, the bottom curve here um, with the lowest risk of relapse and the uh, highest survival. And then the patients that were positive for MRD at the end of treatment. But then there's this, this other set of patients that well, at the end was negative for MRD, but it was positive at some point along the way. And they don't, they don't do that much better than a patient that was positive at the end. Sort of fitting this, remember the slide I showed you with the steepness of the decline? It would certainly fit with this, that, that the dynamics of response matter. Um, and as a last study, um, that looked at induction therapy, and I wanted to show this because I think this um, brings up the question whether we should have a test like this available at, at institutions like here. Um, it's the same study that I showed you, survival curves, before a large study that was just recently done. And among these 1,200 patients were about 300 patients with core binding factor leukemias. So those that are characterized be either an A21 translocation or in version 16. And those are clinically, um, as a group, considered favorable. But it's very, it, it's very well known and feared that a subset of those patients actually don't do well. And we're still struggling to identify which patients those are. And there's, there's some data saying that, well, maybe it's a second mutation. There's like a, a FLIT3 ITD or a, or a KIT mutation. There's sort of conflicting data on that. But what this study has done is, is simply looked at, again, patients in remission, simply looked at what's the burden of A21 positive or inversion 16 positive cells um, at the time the induction chemotherapy is completed. And what's the difference between your pretreatment values? And when you do this, you can really s split up this thought to be favorable set into you know, a subset that really is extraordinarily favorable with almost no relapse and, and great survival. But then there's a set that, even though a remission was achieved, the likelihood of relapse is very, very high. And, and su suggests that this might be a good test to separate out this, this subset of patients. And it's very similar between A21 and version 16 leukemias. So moving on to, to a different stage of, of AML treatment, transplantation. Um, 
And for AML, for a while, autotransplants were relatively frequently done, not so much anymore. Um, but there's some data on the value of MRD as, as an outcome predictor for patients that underwent autotransplantation. This is just a sort of a list of studies we found when we wrote this review um, on AML patients that were underwent transplantation in morphologic remission, but with or without MRD. And just sort of looking at the numbers, if you're MRD positive by whatever threshold the study has used, the relapse risk was extraordinarily high and certainly much higher than if no disease was detectable. And at the time that I started sort of looking at MRD in, in transplantation, there really was one study available from a, from a pediatric cohort of patients looking at outcomes of the allogeneic transplantation. And very congruent with what I showed you before, patients that had MRD, they did worse than patients that didn't, primarily because of an increased risk of relapse. So this was the, the, the starting point for us to look at our experience here um, at, at the University of Washington and the, and the SCCA. And in our initial study, we looked at about 100 patients um, that underwent transplantation, allogeneic transplantation from May 2006 on. And this time point was chosen because at that time the transplanters started using the UW lab to do their pre-transplant assessments. And from that time on, the, the methodology for MRD assessment has, has remained relatively the same. Maybe there's some nuances, but the, the general parameters have remained the same. Um, so at that time, we looked between 2006 and 2009, and we restricted it to patients that were transplanted in the first morphologic remission based on marrow criteria, so less than 5% plasma morphology. And we allow both recovered or not recovered blood counts. Um, and we didn't care so much about the details of the transplantation. And we're very fortunate that the, the transplant service is a very organized um, service. And pre-transplant evaluations are standard for every patient that goes through. So, so this is a very complete cohort. And in fact, out of the patients that were transplanted, only one person did not have a pre-transplant assessment done in this time period. So this is really pretty much, that's the experience from the center. Um, and just very briefly, the, the assay that was used, and I'm sure you, most of you are, are familiar with it, it's a 10-color um, assay um, where, and I, I've listed the antigens here, where up to a million events are collected and MRD is considered as, as any deviation from a normal expression pattern. Um, and, and I'll get to this back in a, in a little later. At the time we started, we just considered any level that was detectable as positive. So we didn't define any arbitrary cutoff initially. We just said everything that we can detect or that the, the lab medicine people can detect is considered positive. And among these 99 patients, about 25 or so were MRD positive and um, 74 were MRD negative. And when we looked at the outcomes of these patients, the, the, they're really quite strikingly different. So when you look on the left-hand side, patients that were MRD negative, their long-term three, four-year survival overall survival, disease-free survival is 70% is or plus. Um, and on the other hand, for those 74 patients or so that were MRD positive, their survival is much, much worse. And when you look on the right-hand side, there's, there's, a f there's small differences with regard to non-relapse mortality, so, so toxicities from the transplantation. But the big difference comes in the relapse risk with MOD positive patients having a, a, a relapse risk of 70, 80% and MOD negative patients somewhere in the range of 30% or so. And when we then sort of 
ask the question, well, how, how does that pan out when you put other disease risk factors into the equation? And there's a number of them are known, you know, cytogenetic risk, um, have blood counts recovered before transplantation? How long was the patient in remission? Um, are there still cytogenetic abnormalities at the time of transplantation? When you put all these things into multivariate analysis, all factors except MRD f fell out. And MRD was a highly statistically significant and pretty remarkable um, factor with a, with a high hazard ratio for, for all the four outcomes we looked at, um, overall mortality, disease-free survival, relapse, and even for non-relapse mortality, which is something we still don't quite understand why that is. Um, so when we finished that study, there were still some open questions left. Um, one being, well, does it matter? Is there a difference if a patient's transplant is CR1 or CR2? And is there a threshold above which we should consider MOD positives? Should we define an arbitrary threshold between what we can detect and what we should detect? So we went back to our patients. This time we spread it out again from May 2006 to 2011. We found, um, and we allowed not just first remission, but second remission as well. And this time we found about 250 patients. Um, and the results are very, very similar. Um, again, for patients that were negative by, for MRD have a much, much better outcome than those that were MRD positive, and really no difference between people transplanting first or second remission. Um, and again, primarily due to changes or, or different risks of relapse. Um, and then sort of the more interesting question perhaps is looking at, well, does it matter how much MRD you have? And there's some studies that have suggested this sort of gradual worsening of, of relapse risk if the MRD burden increases. Um, and we were, in our court, we were unable to find that. Um, there was perhaps a suggestion that patients with the highest levels of MRD did perhaps a little worse, but statistically we couldn't find a difference. And the difference was really primarily between those that were negative and those that were minimally positive, and not between a little positive or a little more positive. Um, then again, if we, if we put all these factors in a multivariate analysis, um, many, of them, many of the other ones cancel out, um, and MRD remains independently associated with, with poor outcome, um, with increased relapse and, and shortened survival. So sort of summarizing all this, I think it's, it's, it's well established in EML now and in other diseases that MRD is an independent factor for, for prognosis. And that's true for induction chemotherapy, it's true for consolidation therapy, and it's true for different settings of transplantation. It's even true, and I, I didn't show the data, it's even true for reduced intensity transplantation. That's something we're currently working on. So regardless of where you're looking at, at what stage, it seems to be helpful. And at least in, in, in our hands, even the smallest amounts of MRD make a big, make a big difference. Um, and at least using the, the methodology that is used here, there really seems little rationale to define a cutoff that is above what's technically feasible. So now the much more difficult question is, is it useful for decision making? And you know, think about this, there's, there's two ways of thinking, so, well, Maybe it's just a surrogate for something bad. And that's certainly true. And it may just say something about the disease that is not treatable. And, and at least in 2014, many of, the chemo, many of the therapeutic treatments that we have, they're not that different one from another. Um, so maybe it simply tells you something about the disease that is not curable or not very likely to be cured with regards of what we have available. But then, you know, if it were a marker, um, then of course the question is, it would be helpful if we could show that reverting an MRD positive stage into an MRD negative one actually changes the outcome. And to be particularly useful, well, it would need to be that early intervention actually makes a difference. 
and waiting for overt disease relapse somehow makes the survival less likely. Um, and that, of course, implies that whatever risk you're taking for this additional therapy, it, it needs to be factored in in this equation. But just sort of looking through, you know, what could you do? Um, and what have people thought about doing? And actually, what have people tried to do? And that is intensification of conventional chemotherapy. That's perhaps the most trivial one to, to do. Um, but then, and I'll show, you, I'll show you data to this, well, if a patient has MRD, maybe you want to move away from chemotherapy. Maybe you want to try transplantation because that's probably your most efficient way of preventing a disease recurrence. And if you're sort of set on, well, I'm going to use a transplant, there's still ways of how you can modify this. Um, you could give them some more pre-transplant pre therapy. You could switch from autotransplant to allogeneic transplant. You can intensify the regimen that you use for conditioning. Or you can use some strategies post-transplant preemptively. And, you know, I, I could essentially stop here and say, well, there's really not that much out there, but I'm going to show you some examples. But I think overall, even though you read all this, well, this is sort of, has, well, it's, it's good to target MRD. If you look carefully, there really aren't any well-controlled studies. And what's out there is, is oftentimes not controlled, not even controlled with historic patients. And it's very challenging. We know, and particular because we know that our supportive care has improved tremendously over the last 15, 20 years. And it's very difficult to make good comparators um, if you don't use a, um, something that, that is very current. So um, with, with these challenges in mind, I, my conclusion was when I looked through the literature, there really isn't anything well-controlled out there that would argue for MRD-directed therapy being beneficial. But I'll show you some examples and maybe the, the best ones I could find. So one is a very, very recent one. Again, this, this looks at uh, a set of core binding factor leukemia. So again, this is a subset that is thought to be favorable in general, um, but there's outliers. So this is a study that has looked at about 140 patients um, with A21 leukemia that went through sort of conventional induction chemotherapy. And then for those that achieved a remission, they, up, they got some more consolidation chemotherapy. And then MRD was assessed again by PCR looking at the, the load of A21 transcripts. And patients were assigned to different treatment strategies. If they had persistent disease or, or didn't meet this MRD negative, well, actually they used, they used three log reduction in, in A21 burden. If that one was achieved, they were considered low risk. And the idea was to not use a transplantation, but to give some more chemotherapy rounds. On the other hand, if, you, if a patient did not meet this, this three log reduction, they were considered high risk. And the intent was to move them to transplantation. And of course, there were patients that didn't want to do this or for whatever else. Um, and this is where it becomes difficult to really interpret the data appropriately. You don't quite know how the decisions were made. Um, but there were patients that didn't follow that, that strategy. And they were used as sort of controls. And the conclusion from that the authors drew from, from their observations was that if you assign patients that were considered high risk of transplantation, you improve their outcome. And this is sort of shown on the, on the bottom here. So these are the patients that did not have a, a very solid reduction in, in, in transcript burden. Patients that underwent transplantation had a much lower risk of relapse and a better survival than those that underwent chemotherapy. And on the other hand, those that were considered low risk because they had good reductions, their transplantation didn't seem beneficial. In fact, it even seemed detrimental. Now, of course, we don't really know why a patient didn't go to transplant. And it could just be that they're sicker and for whatever else reason. So it's very hard to know. Um, but 
sort of the level of evidence that that's about what's available right now. And then the alternative is, of course, is, well, could we use a therapeutic strategy that is not cross-reactive with what else we have? And for AML, we don't have that available right now. But there are some new drugs that are sort of emerging and that will enter the field in the next few years. And they have entered the field of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And that's what I'm going to show you on this slide. That's a, a bispecific antibody that targets a, a leukemia-associated antigen. It brings in cytotoxic T cells for, for directed lysis of tumor cells. And in this study, they, they looked at, and it's a small set of 20 patients, they looked at patients that failed chemotherapy with either overt disease or minimal residual disease left after intensive chemotherapy. And from experience, if you, these patients have a very, very high risk of not responding to subsequent therapies and, and, and not doing well. And with this antibody, there was a, somewhere in the range of an 80% response rate, and the survivals looked very, very favorable. So again, this is not controlled. There's, there's probably a lot of selection bias. Um, but it, it at least suggests that if we had non-cross-reactive or non-cross-resistant therapies available, perhaps we could do something for patients that are MRD positive. Um, and then think about, well, should you change your strategy of transplantation? Again, this is not well controlled, um, but there are and I showed you the data. If you are MRD positive and you undergo an autotransplant, your, your chance of relapse is somewhere in the range of 80 to 100 percent. So it's very, it's very, very high. And there, there are sort of studies that have used the donor, no donor approach to see if, if the outcomes are any better if you assign patients to allotransplantation instead. Um, and this is just one example that I found where were the patients that underwent allotransplantation did somewhat better than those that underwent autotransplant because they didn't have a donor. Um, so suggesting that perhaps if you change from an auto to an allo setting to, in, to get some benefit from a, from a graft versus leukemia effect, you might influence outcomes somewhat. And sort of maximizing graft versus leukemia effects is something that the field has thought about a lot. Um, and again, there's no real well-controlled data, but uncontrolled ones do suggest that if you're using strategies that minimize this graft versus leukemia effect by using sort of T-cell depletion, for example, that the risk of relapse remains particularly high in patients with that are MRD positive. On the other hand, um, if you augment this graft versus leukemia effect, then maybe you do something beneficial. And just very briefly, two studies that have sort of tried to do this and in, in cohorts of patients with acute leukemia, some of them had AML, some of them had ALL. Um, and they looked at MRD. In this one, it's a mixture of flow cytometry or PCR. And the idea was for those that were MRD positive to assign them to donor lymphocyte infusions. Um, and what they found is if you did this for patients that MRD positive, they, the outcomes become almost similar or become similar to those that didn't have MRD. Whereas those that didn't get DLI, well, they were much worse. But then when you read the paper carefully and you see, well, who actually did not get donor lymphocytes, they say, well, they didn't get it because of early disease recurrence. Well, that makes this somewhat difficult to interpret or because of you know, severe graft versus host disease. So it, it, there's a lot of caveats, even though the data look very sort of promising. Um, but it has been used in, in, in multiple studies, and that's another one, again, with the same idea if you have MRD positive, positivity of the transplantation, 
you, you try to augment your, your immune system's response against the leukemia cells by using either DLI plus or minus IL-2. And again, you, you, it seems like perhaps you can improve their outcomes towards patients, towards the outcomes of patients that were MOD negative to begin with. So I think hopefully I convinced you that, uh, that there really isn't a whole lot that is very well controlled, even though the approaches seem to go in the right direction. But sort of the emerging, the emerging strategies that, that seem to come up are for MOD positive patients that one should intensify treatments by putting them to allotransplantation if you can and to minimize or to, to use unmanipulated grafts to sort of maximize the graft versus leukemia effects. Um, and then of course, maybe the more interesting question even for MOD negative patients, they seem to have a very good outcome, both with transplantation and with chemotherapy. And the question really comes up is, do they really need a transplant or do they need an allotransplant or could you get away with an autotransplant instead? So sort of to conclude, um, it's, it's, it's been clear over the last years that detection of MRD is, very, is, is feasible in patients that are in morphologic remission by a number of methodologies and the methodologies are, are evolving as, as we speak. Um, and I think it's, it's very established that it is a, that is a risk factor and identifies a subset of patients that will do poorly um, if they have MRD. Um, and it's an appealing concept that you do something directed towards this MRD positivity, but there really isn't any controlled data that, that are very, very convincing at this point. But sort of think about, well, what, what should this mean for, for us here or for the clinician? Um, so I do think that MRD assessment should be standard of care for AML patients. And I, I think at least here it should be multi, it should be by flow cytometry, um, just given the limitations that other methodologies have. Um, and there are um, some patients that are discrepant from one methodology to the other. Um, so maybe it makes sense to add more than one methodology together. Um, but then what I was sort of, with, with the PCR assessments, it seems like for certain patient subsets, it is helpful to have these available. And, and, and um, David was just telling me that this MPM1 assay is sort of coming along, and, and Brent was mentioning this last week. Um, and the data for the core binding factor leukemia seemed pretty strong that this may actually be a, a test that should be available and we should use it. And I have to say, I, I haven't used it so far and I don't know who else of my colleagues is using it, but the data would argue that one should. Um, and sort of thinking ahead, well, the field probably will move into the direction of improving sensitivity by either tweaking the existing methodologies or developing new ones. And, and some of you are involved in next generation sequencing and, and other methodologies to, to perhaps do that. And I think a big issue, and I didn't talk about this at all, is, is standardization of these MRD assays, which of course make it very, very difficult to interpret data um, if, they're, if they're used in very different ways. And standardization, both with regard to the methodology you're using, but also the timing that you're using it. Um, to assess patients. And to me, sort of the biggest thing for the future is really to test this idea that, that therapies directed at MRD make a difference for patients. And I think what's, what's been ignored, and I couldn't find anything meaningful for that, is, is the financial impact of MRD testing. Um, I mean, in one way for reimbursement, but even just for, for cost, is, is it beneficial and which ones should you do, which ones should you not do. Um, but I wanted to sort of maybe open up the discussion with some provocative things that, that you can find in the recent literature. And this is question, is there actually still a value of using morphologic assessments of bone marrows for patients with AML? And, and this is a study that has looked at that question um, using a cohort of patients 
that were treated in a multi-center pediatric trial. And there were about 200 or so patients that had a total of over, or over 1,300 bone marrow specimens available sequentially collected along the course. And, and the question was, what does morphology help you to say about outcomes? What does flow cytometry help you? And maybe not surprisingly, there's, there's a considerable discordance between the results from morphology and the results from flow cytometry in that um, if you have a low amount of blast by morphology that the, the flow cytometric disease burden can vary quite significantly. Um, but also, and this is sort of shown on the, on the right-hand side, if the pathologist was convinced there are leukemic blasts, even then the range of disease burden by flow cytometry was, was quite considerable. But I sort of wanted to finish off with this. Um, so this is looking at the value of one methodology if you control for the other. So if you're looking at panel A, those are patients that were that had no MRD by flow cytometry. And then the question is, well, does it matter if the patient has more or less than 5% blast by morphology? And it's superimposable. If you're looking at patients that were MRD positive, again, by flow cytometry, and okay, well, does it matter if you have more or less blast by morphology? Well, maybe a little bit, but statistically, not so much. But then you flip it around and you say, well, now you're looking at patients that have less than 5% blast by morphology. What is the impact of MRD? And you start seeing these big spreads about in, in patients depending on the burden of MRD. So something very similar that I showed you on, on many of the other slides. And the, and, but that's also true if you're looking at the subset of patients that had more than 5% blast by morphology. Again, the spread is pretty dramatic when, you, when you're looking at, when you stratify it by MRD levels. So I think it sort of begs the question whether there still is a value of morphology assessment of a marrow or whether one should just abandon this and do flow cytometry instead. And I think I stopped with this, but I'd be curious what the laboratory medicine experts think of that. Uh, the question about panel D, so does that mean that the implication is the blasts that were seen on the smear were not actually malignant blasts? I, I, think, I think that's by, by far the, most, the, the biggest contributor. I mean, that there, it, it probably is a proportion that you didn't detect because there was no abnormality by immunophenotype. But I think the implication is that's how I read, that's how I read this. Yeah, is that it's just by number it's too much, but by phenotype, they, they seem normal. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat the question, please? Oh, yes. I knew I would forget that. So the question was whether, um, wh whether the, the, uh, the flow, by, uh, the, the uh, morphology bias count is just a reflection of, of normal blasts that are increased. Yes. Um, one of the things that, that puzzles me uh, sort of globally about looking at many different types of animal residual disease, especially with molecular alterations, is that some of them are found in normal people. Um, and some of them are actually really common. So not AML, but in CML, you know, there's BCR ABLES in there. And that's depending, it seems that the more sensitive an assay you have, the more frequent it is in, in normal people. Maybe a third of the people in this room have Philadelphia chromosomes in them. How does that confound the approach to MRD detection? Is you know MRD that you find simply the normal basal rate of the other non-cancerous cells making translocations in these people, maybe? Or do you just assume that if you find a molecular alteration that's come back that has to have been the same one that you initially got, you initially killed with your chemotherapy? How do I repeat that question? So, 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 so the question being that some of the abnormalities are, are detected in seemingly normal people, right? And how do you distinguish that from, 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 from actual minimal residual disease? And it's, it's a real thing even in, in, in AML. I mean, it, it's been known for a long time that 
patients with um, A21 leukemias that are in long-term remission and seemingly are perfectly normal, they have a very low burden of A21. And if you grow out colonies, some of them have the A21 transcript. Um, I, 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 you know, it's, it's one possibility of to explain this is that A21 is, is, you know, say it's at the very early stage of a leukemic process and, but it's not sufficient to cause full-blown disease. So you, you sort of reduced your disease back to sort of a pre-leukemic stage and that you can control that. I think that's one way how some people think about it. So is the implication then that multi-parameter models or tests that look for, like flow where you're looking at a big phenotype rather than a single marker, you may be actually getting at looking at actual onco, actually oncologically important MRD as opposed to things that are simply tagged with a marker. Yeah, so the question is how do you approach this? Um, the, um, you know, it will depend on the marker. Like for APL, I think the thinking is that if you have a patient that was MRD negative by PCR and turns positive by PCR, that is almost a guarantee for relapse to occur. And I think for the, for the A21s, it, I think there you, you may actually not be able to just rely on it being there or not, but it's a question of what are the dynamics over time. So maybe um, that you need to put this, again, sort of the kinetic part of the, in, in, into the assessment. I would also add that it has something to do with the sensitivity too. So you can say, well, yeah, lots of people have these translocations. The actual fact is the way, you know, sort of the way we do our assays, we're not seeing a lot of, you know, quote unquote, false positives, or we're not seeing a lot of unexpected positives in people who you know, just don't have disease. So I think it's, it's partly just a theoretical concern, but in actual day-to-day -day practice, I'm not sure we're seeing. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think that A21s are that common in normal people from the street. I think you can detect them in people that had, that are seemingly cured, but had A21 many, many, many years ago.